I studied filmmaking in the US during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Today on the Nadir's show, I will interview Pepe Escobar, journalist, author, and independent geopolitical analyst. He has many influential articles in prominent newspapers and news websites. His ideas and insights are enlightening. Watch the show. Pepe Escobar, a Brazilian journalist and independent geopolitical analyst, is a foreign correspondent. He's the former roving correspondent for Asia Times Online, where he wrote the column The Roving Eye from 2000 to 2014, covering events, news, and analysis throughout Asia and the Middle East. He's one of the main analysts for RT and Sputnik News and other popular news broadcasting agencies like Al Jazeera, Press TV, and Tom Dispatch. One of the main highlights of his career is when Escobar reported extensively from Afghanistan. In 2001, Escobar interviewed Ahmad Shah Mas'ud shortly before he was assassinated. Also, his article, Get Osama Now or Else, predicting US intervention in Afghanistan, was published by Asia Times Online two weeks before the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Escobar is also the author of several books, such as Speedball, Globalization, How the Globalized World is Dissolving into Liquid War, Red Zone Blues, A Snapshot of Baghdad During the Surge, Obama Does Globalization, and Empire of Chaos. His latest book is 2030, also published by Nimble Books in December 2015. Hey, Pepe. Thank you so much. It's so good to have you here. Enormous pleasure. Thank you. In Beirut. Um, let me just go over with one of my favorite subjects, Ahmad Shah Massoud, and uh, what happened to him, the martyr Ahmad Shah Massoud, and what happened right before 9-11. And mm -hmm. the, there's this famous article that you wrote, uh, Get Osama Now or Else, which became widely seen uh, and became rather controversial. Tell me, um, how did you decide to go to see Ahmad Shah Massoud um, two or three weeks before 9-11 happened and uh, prior to his assassination? Um, wh what, was, what was so great about Ahmad that you wanted to see? Well, it was a question, of course, in journalistic terms of being at the right place at the right time, right? But this has a long previous story. Uh, I had crossed Taliban Afghanistan from Torkham, uh, Pakistani border, to Islamkila, the Iranian border, uh, with my photographer. Uh, very funny because we, we were trying to chat up with the Iranian guards and said, can we go, go inside and take a look? Obviously, it never happened. So this was in the summer of 2000. And it was impossible for obvious reasons to go to the area controlled by Massoud, the Panjir Valley and the north. It, 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 there was no transit between Taliban and Afghanistan. It was a war zone, in fact. So then we said, okay, let's try the next summer and see what happens. We had a letter from Massoud's representative at the UN in New York giving us a laissez-passer, basically, so we could get there. The problem is how to get to, to the Panjir. I know that uh, Amatia was pe uh, peculiar about who was going to interview him, 
who is going to approach him. Of course. So we ha I'm sure we cleared before. Uh, my photographer in New York, he was not doing photojournalism, but uh, he had many conversations with Masoud's representatives. They said, look, I'm going with a, a journalist. Then I, I sent my articles. They read what I wrote. So obviously I had to be screened before, right? So we had the okay to get there and wait for an interview. To get to the Panjir Valley was quite something. It took us over a month just to get there. We tried... We were smuggled from Chitral to Nuristan. It was a completely shambolic stuff. We had to come back because we were left in the middle of nowhere. Then we got a UN flight to Dushanbe, and we were waiting in Dushanbe for a few days, at least a week, if I remember well. And we got one of Masood's helicopters that brought us to the Panjir Valley. And over there was great because at the time Masood had a, a small guest house for visitors. It was a small house with two or three uh, rooms. Uh, the Mujahideen were wonderful. Anything that we, anywhere we wanted to go, they took us. So uh, we went to see the prisoners, where I met at the time Uyghurs, Chechens, and Uzbeks that and I remember are, very well. And these are actually the Takfiris. Takfi, of course, Takfiris. And uh, via translators, we could talk briefly with some of them. The Uyghurs, for instance, they told us that uh, they were jihadis. And, and I asked them, uh, what, what about uh, Xinjiang in China? Do you want Xing, uh, Uyghur lands apart from China? It says, yes, but, uh, but, they, but they had an Al-Qaeda frame of mind. They were repeating Al-Qaeda slogans, essentially. Yeah? So, so it was already a known fact that Ahmad Masoud's enemies were the Takfiris. Absolutely. But there, there's no question. And then finally, when we had our interview, uh, formally, uh, sitting on a long table, Masoud with some of his commanders, he had one translator who was translated from English to Dari. But he understood French. Masoud understood French very well. So I, some of my questions were actually in French because I knew he, he, immediately he would get it. And he would even answer without, without talking to the translator. Uh, he said that, uh, very specifically, at the time there was an alliance. He said, I think in these terms, an unholy alliance between Pakistan, ISI, uh, Saudi Arabia, and the Taliban. Explicitly, explicitly. And he was the only one in Afghanistan fighting them, which was true. Uh, of course, he was, um, in, a, in a sense, complaining that uh, help from Iran and Russia could be much more than they were doing at the time. He was fighting by himself. He had old Soviet tanks, uh, old Soviet helicopters, of course. But he was planning a battle when we got there. He, he showed us some maps. He was planning an offensive in Talokan. He said, if we win this battle, we're going to extend our territory a little bit more and we can prolong the fight. So this is what we, he was doing when he left the interview. We were in, a, in, the, in, in his small village in the Panjir, Bazarak. It's a, a one-street villa in the Panjir Valley. And then he took an helicopter to go to where he was planning the final stage of the battle, Kwaja Bahajudin where he stayed for the next 15 days and where he was killed on September 9 by those two fake journalists. Uh, they were two Tunisians disguised as journalists, a journalist and a cameraman. The explosives were inside the camera. When they placed the camera inside the room to start the interview with my suit, the camera exploded. One of them was killed on the spot. Masood, he had shrapnel piercing his heart. That was the cause of death. We only learned about this much later, of course. And the other one escaped, but one of the Mujahideen went after him and he was killed on the spot. So there were no living witnesses, which was not a good thing. Uh, at the time, on the next day, on the tents, I received a very short email from one of our, uh, our friends in the Panjir Sir. The commander has been shot. They could not admit that he, wa he was already killed. They took him by helicopter to Dushanbe. I think when he got to Dushanbe, he was already dead, unfortunately. And this was, of course, two days and then one day before 9-11. And 9-11 was in the mo morning in the US, 
uh, night in the Panjir of the 11th, right? And my first instinctive reaction was, oh shit, this was Al-Qaeda. Then I started to think that no, maybe this was much more complicated. But the fact was at the time that the assassination of Massoud was a sort of uh, first stage act before 9-11. How or how this was staged, we still don't know in detail. What I did learn later, I came back to the Panjir uh, in 2002 and I did an invest a month-long investigation over there, talking to everybody that I could, and we established that the letter that these uh, two takfiris were carrying was signed by Sayaf. Sayaf was one of the Afghan commanders. They were inimical to Massoud. They had fought together before. But uh, he was a Saudi Arabia asset in Afghanistan. So obviously there was a direct connection with the Saudis, which also means, in, in, in other ways, Al-Qaeda. Wahhabis, essentially. So they killed Massoud. This is proved. On behalf of whom is another story that we still don't know in detail, right? So after uh, our interview, which was, I think, August 20th, something like this, uh, we went on a crazy journey to get to an another, to Faisabad, if I remember well, to wait for a UN flight to go back to Peshawar. And this took forever, <laughs> as usual. When I got to Peshawar, I had already a network of uh, journalists and uh, activists. They were feeding me information essentially because I was not American. We became friends. They said, we trust you. We read what you write. You don't lie. So, okay, we pass information to you on, on a daily basis. And one of those was a bomb, really, literally. They told me that the Americans had organized a commando to go to Kandahar like the commando that may have killed Osama bin Laden. The same thing. Go to Kandahar, snatch bin Laden, extract him from Afghanistan, take him, take him to the US. This was August, uh, end of August before 9-11. It was not afterwards, right? So we published this article on August 30th. Uh -huh. This was the day it was published. At the time, Asia Times was very small, so I, I'm sure very few people read it. After 9-11, of course, we had this, everybody in the U.S. had discovered this weird site in Asia publishing. Ah, something's going to happen. So it was a case of being there at the right time, right? Now. <laughs> That's, yeah, that is wonderful. Of course, you're, you're usually on the beat on many issues. Um, let me ask you... Um, your trip uh, here to uh, Lebanon. Yes. Uh, w did you look forward to it? Immensely, especially because my last time here was 2008. It was a long time ago, 10 years ago. Uh, at the time, I remember, I saw how South Beirut was destroyed. And it was the beginning of the rebuilding process. And now, now I could not even recognize uh, most of the places. And everything is rebuilt. which is. But the highlight was, of course, our trip to South Lebanon it made a huge impression for me uh, geographically, uh, topographically, and graphically to see everything and put in, in the context the invasions, the organization, the networking. Uh, and I was not expecting to see a wall. So that was a shock because uh, I, I don't know if people in the region know that this wall in the Western media doesn't exist. I never saw pictures of this wall anywhere in the West. So it is an ultra high tech invisible wall, but of course it's, it's not a good, it's not a <laughs> politically correct to say, look, the Israelis just built another wall against Lebanon. So this made me, it was a huge impression. Uh, had you been to the South before? No, it was my first time. You hadn't been south of Tyre? No, never, never. So after everything that I traveled and I lived in this, around here in Southwest Asia, for me was an enormous experience. I'm still um, digesting it little by little before I write anything about it, in fact. Excellent. Um, we were, well, we, we have met many times in Iran. 
previously, and we planned this thing out here. Um, and what uh, what is missing between all these thinking people that you have, you you know here in in Beirut and previously in conferences like our conference? Mm -hmm. what, what is missing among all of us that uh, we 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 convene and then we separate? Exactly. Um, one someone was suggesting that. We should sit down and think more about what to do to, uh, as journalists, as international sure. journalists, to counterattack all the strategies that have been that they've been imposing on everyone, and uh, I mean, including sanctions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Journalists as thinkers, because uh, and pe and people who have thoughts, they're not politicians. They don't have power. They don't have money. They don't. But they are thinking people, and they do have influence. They have the pen, and they can infiltrate. Uh, don't, why, why, haven't, why haven't we even in the past, at the end of these uh, gatherings and uh, conventions, sat down to think what to do next, how to counterattack this uh, invasion, if you will? Well, I think we need a think tank, because this is, uh, this is how it's done in the West. The problem is these things, tanks are financed by corporations, some of them uh, uh, weapons manufacturers, for instance, with enormous budgets. So they can have uh, tens of scholars with enormous salaries researching something, then they publish, then it gets a rollover effect because they go on CNN, they go on, on the major networks, uh, they are published by a big publishing company. So it, it's a, an inferno machine, in fact. We progressives, all of us, uh, we are fragmented. Uh, we, are, we work in different nations and sometimes like we, we meet once or twice a year maximum. And then, as you said correctly, everybody goes uh, his own way. So we need uh, a, a, not a centralizing. It, it's not a good thing. I, I like the idea of having a, a horizontal thinking everywhere, but we need a publication. Uh, we need to publish books, uh, all of us, in different languages simultaneously. Uh, articles, we can coordinate articles on something uh, uh, on the news. If we have a breaking news uh, involving something really, really hot, in 24 hours, all of us can you know, have our artillery in articles everywhere in different languages, well coordinated. Right? But we need I would say we need a publishing house, it's essential, and a think tank. Even if it's not uh, a think tank physically installed somewhere, a think tank online, of course, a supple, uh, that can be uh, uh, anytime anybody can intervene in many languages. We have this already, but it's fragmented. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, Réseau Voltaire. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. It's a mini think tank, yes, you know. Yes. Even my friend the Saker, who should have been here, but he lives in Florida, and obviously he could not leave the U.S. Uh, he met, uh, from a small website, he he has an operation in many languages as a well. Saker Latin America, Saker France, Saker Italy, and he's a one. It's a one man operation. It's, a, it's amazing what a one man operation can, can do and be, be influential. So we, so we need to multiply this in, into a, a network, in fact. Uh, our narrative is much more powerful because it's based on facts. Uh, the other narrative is based on fiction and lies, essentially. So uh, the fact that we only have the pen but we are telling the truth, it matters for a lot of people, especially young people. Like, I'll give you just an example. Uh, when I went to Brazil to interview President Lula in prison, one of the things that, that he told us was, uh, I like the idea that you're trying to talk to young people. Mm -hmm. So he sees it. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a world statement, recognized all over the world. He said, I, we need to talk to young people. So this means uh, uh, social networks, uh, publishing, you know, an avalanche of information as well. And visually, like you said correctly, Iran has some of the best documentary filmmakers in the world, which is true. Get them on board as well to do interviews. What do you do with another show, but expand it mm -hmm. with more people and maybe simultaneously? Um, now that you mentioned uh, the Nader show, um, 
we, you mentioned a couple of times the interview with General Haji Zadeh. Yes. Uh, and how did that go? How did, how did it strike you and where did it go? Well, it's uh, before, before another show, uh, I had contacted one of my, my friends at Press TV. I said, look, I have some questions. Can you find an uh, IRGC general to answer this question? I said, okay, send me. A so I sent the questions, some, the same questions that I sent to you yes, afterwards. Right, right. And then he replied to me. I said, look, I sent it to two generals. They said, yes, it's interesting, but we cannot talk about it because these are matters of national security. I understand perfectly because some of the questions were very <laughs> straight yes. to the point, yes. right? But talking to you is different because they talk in Farsi. They talked, uh, you know, uh, of course, he could not get into details, but the mere fact that he was talking about official IRGC policy, it's huge. You never hear this in the West. So the effect was enormous. So as I told you, some of my American friends, they sent to some very powerful people in New York and Washington, say, look, if you, you, you need to listen to what they're saying. This is what they're saying, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, so in, in essence, Iran is a point of great interest because it's, it's, uh, it, it does make its waves in the region and then the ripples go out and do make shifts. Sure. And but um, and we we're not um, so the the planning of the program of course is not on national television or for national television but has the liberty of to do anything it wants in terms of anything for an international, for international audience, international audience yes. you know, through the through the internet. Um, so we'll continue and uh, uh, I like people like yourself because you you you're from a very important region South America. And you let into a lot of places because you, they trust you more. They, it's it's amazing, Nader. When I when I was working in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, for instance, and then in the Middle East, it opens doors. You we usually start a conversation about something, football, music, you know, samba, whatever. And when I get to the meat of the matter, they are already oh, okay. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's uh, it, the difference is. It's, Amazing. Yeah. If if they know that you are um, Australian or French or German, it's m complicated. If you're from Italy, uh, Italy has fabulous soft power all over the world, so it, it helps as well. Yeah. Sometimes I talk with Italian with some of them. They say, "Okay, I'm from Italy. It helps as well." <laughs> you can be chameleonic, you know, and it works. Yes. Uh, Great, um, because the time of the show is, is finished, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you. Great, great. <laughs> Thank you. Take Thank good, you. Thank you very care. much. Take good care. I hope you have enjoyed the show, so stay tuned. <laughs>